All right, everybody. Thanks for listening in. You're listening to Windshield Time at Mountain Land Supply. This is a podcast that we're creating to let you know everything behind the scenes here at Mountain Land Supply. Some of the stuff in front of the scenes that's less interesting, but a lot of stuff behind the scenes that you don't get to see every day. Uh, we called it Windshield Time because that's kind of what it is. It's like if you jumped in the truck with us and you went for a drive with us, we call that taking and getting a little bit of windshield time. So that's what this is. It's as if you were in on a conversation with the executive team here at Mountain Land Supply. So welcome aboard. So today you got me. I'm Joey Little. I serve as president here. You got Brandon Johnson, CEO. Hey, everyone. And unfortunately, we're joined by our CFO, the geek in the room, Bruce Egbert. <laughs> Hurtful. <laughs> So today we're just going to give you a little bit of background on what this uh, podcast is going to look like, and then we're going to talk a little bit about something we think you might find interesting, which is how our share price is calculated. For you being an owner here at Mountain Land Supply Company, you should have been told by this time that you do get some shares, and that those shares hopefully will have a little bit more value every year, and then you can have that in your retirement. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. So maybe Brandon... Maybe tell them a little bit about how an ESOP is created, and then we'll kind of go from there to what the share price is. Yeah, so an ESOP, man, it's a it's a complicated process, I'm not going to lie. So when Mountainland did it back in the day, right, um, I remember getting called in and asked that, and getting told that, hey, we're going to go an ESOP. And I remember asking, you know, what's my timeline on this? And I got told that it should have been done yesterday. <laughs> So As I was usual. like, oh, yeah. I Yesterday's like, not soon enough. Awesome. So we had a few things going uh, that we needed to clean up. If you remember right, we were at, so that was the end of 2017. We had just done our last, well, not last, second to last merger, and that was the two heating companies, if I remember correctly. Yep. And we had the plumbing and the heating company still separated, but we needed to merge them together. So we did that at the end of April, mm -hmm. if I remember that. Mm-hmm. And then we went into uh, end of July was when we did the ESOP. So really, we had a little bit there, but um, nine months is really what I remember is nine months of just going at it all day long. Now, on a typical company, it just depends on the complexity that we have. Uh, you know, the company has things of that nature that would dictate how long it takes and also how much money it costs, too. A lot of people don't realize that. But for us, we were on that spectrum of complexity. Um, I got told a lot that we are probably one of the most complex transactions that they've ever seen. And these are these are like guys that have been doing this for 20, 30 years. And they were just, you know, they said, we've never seen anything like that. Um, and so it was kind of crazy to be a part of that. And for them to be a part of it, that that's kind of a, you know, a stripe that they were able to earn and something that the recognition that they had that, you know, they've I've heard a lot of times when we go to these conferences, they refer to a complex transaction, and it's kind of interesting being in the audience. You hear, and you're like, "Oh, that's us. Yep, yep, that was us." <laughs> yeah, the problem child. Yeah, exactly. Yep. But you know, complexity for us. What really happened is after we did all the mergers, a lot of people don't know this, but we had 126 shareholders, and individual individual shareholders, shareholders. Um, and so that was after we brought for, together all four of our companies, 126. And a lot of these times when these companies go ESOP. It might be, you know, one person, three people, four people, and they all get in a room that, hey, you want to do this ESOP? Yeah, ESOP sounds great. Let's do an ESOP. And they say, okay, everybody, one, two, three, ESOP. And then, you know, they they, they form an ESOP, right? <laughs> but us, we had a uh, we had 126 shareholders, and every single shareholder has to sell. We decided to go 100%. And some people don't understand, you know, that there's actually different levels that you can go. You know, you can go anything from a 1% to the ESOP, 99% owned by everybody else. Um, usually 30% is where you want to be, and there's a reason for that because in the statutes, it allows you in the tax code, which I'm not an expert at. This guy next The geek me, in the room is. Yeah, he is. He's way better at this tax stuff than I am. But um, These are all compliments. I can feel the pain. <laughs> so thank you, Paul. <laughs> there's a type of exchange that you can do saying, you know, if you're if you sell to an ESOP, then you're actually able to get some tax advantages, which is um, I can take that those proceeds and I can take them and um, invest them in something different, some uh, like kind, basically, of company, not necessarily industry size or anything like that, but you it's traded in the U.S. markets. Is kind of the basic things that you're looking for, and so thirty, but you have to do thirty percent mm -hmm. is the minimum. 
So we looked at 30%. We looked at 50%. I remember we looked at 51. We looked at 70, 75%, then 100. We did all these projections with our consultants and said, hey, what, what, what would be the best outcome for our company? And two things came from that, the, those projections that most people don't know. But we, uh, first of all, we looked at it just for mountain land because at that time, what, when we were doing this, we still had separate companies. And what came back after we did this is uh, mountain land could do it. Mountain land just alone would be very successful at it, but it would be best if all of us were together, which I thought was an interesting thing. And at that time we had different management kind of groups going along. And um, anyways, I remember, uh, you know, over time with things that changed everything, we became one management group, basically over all four companies. Um, so that was, that was good, but we had to do this big merger of it, all the companies. And that's really, we had started that process, but that propelled it even faster saying we got to get these done a little bit faster and we got to be more efficient at them. Um, and then the second thing that um, we came from that trend or that, you know, looking at those projections was 100% is actually where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck. Going, you know, 30%, 50%, 75% or 100%. 100%, if you looked at it through the return on investment, basically, the money that we would put into this, what would be best for the participants would actually be going 100%. So we decided, okay, well, that makes sense. So two things, we got to bring all the companies together so that we can have one company and to be able to do the CESOP and then we got to convince 100% of our shareholders to sell, which means I have to go to 126 people and let them know the benefits of why they should sell to an ESOP at that time. And a lot of those people were past employees. Yep, retired ones. Some of them not as happy with things that, or the, the way things went down with them. Yep. And so it wasn't a lot of easy conversations to have, some of them. I'd say out of the shareholders, if I had to put a percentage in, I, I would, this is just me going off the top of my memory, I would say 70 to 75% of them were, it was an easy conversation to have. The other portions of it, you had to go to employees that, you know, like they might have been disgruntled yeah. with us. You were beating around the bush, I'll yeah. get to it. Ones that were let go from our company, but mm -hmm. they still had some shares. Um, some people that, I, I kid you not, we had one, so we had, um, Close to about 60,000 shares. So it was like 59,000, something, something, something. I don't know. I can't remember. And it's like around 60,000, right? And I remember this one past employee had one share. Remember, we had to get 100%. We had one employee that for some reason, someone told them that if you're a shareholder, you would get better pricing from us. And they were going to build a house <laughs> the next year. <laughs> so they would not sell. Uh, so there's a little bit of conversation. At first, she wouldn't even tell me why. I had no clue. And I was just like, "Would you? Is it? Is it not enough money? Is it the tax implicate? What? What's? You know, what can I help you with? Do you understand why?" And she was just kind of ignoring me, kind of ignoring me. And I'm like, "Oh my gosh, I'm like this whole deal is going to go down because of this one, one lady share. that owns one share is not uh, willing to uh, uh, sell." And so I remember I went to Brent Anderson, the previous CEO. So Brent, I was like, I don't know what to do, man. And I was like, do you know who this is? And he's like, I vaguely remember her. So he's like, but let me give her a call. He's like, I know her husband. I think that's what it was. So he called the husband to talk to him. And that's where it came out. And so he, I remember him calling me and said, okay, I talked to him. I figured it out. And I'm like, what? And he just starts laughing. He's like, this is why. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> he's like, so if you could just go make sure that they have pretty good pricing, that would be We'll, we'll take care of this and done yeah it's like yes and yes we'll yeah. we'll get that so we were able to take care of that but you know, we, we had to get every single one of them so that that 25 percent, we had that the other crazy thing too is um we actually had a shareholder um bob coons so i pr you the people listening you probably don't know who that is honestly i don't know who it is unless you've been here for a while yeah you've <laughs> heard the name i never met the the the, the man because he died Man, I think it was like early 2000s. Uh, yeah. Probably early 2000s. 2005. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, I'd only been here for a few years when he did. Yeah. yeah. So it was, uh, I never met the man, <clears throat> but um, apparently he didn't have family. Yeah. And so he had all these investments in all these different companies. And uh, 
he had mountain land. Well, yeah, I think it was mountain land. He had our mountain states, one of the two. But at the end of the day, it came in, it all rolled in, right? And basically what happened is when he died, all he he left all of his investments and shares to all these people, like uh, nieces, his like his best friend that was his controller or a CPA, and like just random. I mean, I think it went to probably like 12 or 13 different people. And so I remember trying to track these people down. And one of them I tracked down, and she lived down in Florida, I remember. And I was just like, I finally got a hold of you. You know, I'm like, this is what's going on. She's like, oh, I didn't even know that I had shares. Yeah, you've had shares <laughs> in this company. And this is what, you know, we, we got to buy you out and, or we'd like to. And she's like, oh, okay, yeah, great. So send me the paperwork. But it took me like two weeks to just trying to find her contact information. And then um, I remember, I think it was her, she said something in passing like, oh, yeah, have you talked to so-and-so? I'm like, say that name again. And so she said, I went to, I remember I had this huge list in Excel and it was a person I hadn't found. I'm like, yeah, I, do you know her? Oh yeah, she's my sister. I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So you started finding all these like families and everything like that. I'm like, so then I would just, every time I would find someone random, I'd be like, hey, do you know this person? Do you know this person? <laughs> and then I'd randomly just get all this contact information. And But long story short, we got everybody. We were able to find everybody, contact everybody. And they were willing to sell to us. So um, this ESOP thing, I mean, for us, it was very complex how we did it. Cost-wise, just so you're aware, most people, it was over a million dollars for our company to be able to do it. And that's that's one of the biggest things. Which precludes a lot of companies from doing that's it. What, yeah, I was expense. just going to say that is it doesn't let these a lot of these little companies get into. And then what people don't realize, too, is year after year, there's an expense to keep this up. Yeah. That it just, um, for our company, it's worth it. We can afford it. Uh, but you get into the smaller companies and, you know, those costs, the bigger your company is, those costs kind of go up, but there's kind of a minimum threshold that you have to get to. So, you know, a smaller company that maybe makes 20 million, it might be really expensive. So part of those costs every year is we do evaluation of the company and yeah. we just got done with that or, uh, or we're in the process, in the process. But we, we do an audit, which just got done and we partner with a valuation firm that's back East. And Bruce gets to talk with them, and Bruce gets to go through that process. So this is kind of getting to, so now you know how kind of an ESOP is kind of built, and now you now we're going to talk about how that translates into a share price for you. So, yeah. so what I want to hear, Bruce, sorry, I'm going to interrupt here. I yeah. want to hear this timeline. Yeah. So we have this magical date of July 31st, and it might help. Why, do we, why is it July 31st? Because there's a lot of companies that are out yeah. there, right? And December 31st, so we call them a calendar year in. Um, we're actually unusual to have middle of the year, mm -hmm. and it's not even on a quarter, right, of the year. July 31st, we have this. But from July 31st all the way to January? Yeah. I I think it would be really interesting for the you know our, our listeners to understand what is this and you know, what does your team do? What what's happening? behind the scenes that nobody really sees, but there's a lot of work that goes into this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think one of the biggest things is, um, to Brandon's point about that July 31st year end, um, the timeline in which we close the books, maybe let's go through the timeline first and that'll kind of explain why we chose July 31st. Only if you'll eat that mic. Eat that mic. That's much better. There. Okay. <laughs> first time caller, long time listener. Uh-huh. Yeah. Freaking sheets. Okay. Spreadsheets. So <laughs> what happens is with the finance team, July 31st comes within three weeks of the end of July, actually two weeks, our auditors are on site. So what that means is that the finance team has to have the entire year closed out. So a lot of us have been through our month end close. Um, that generally takes about 15 days. So in that same time period, Mike and his team have to have the entire financial statements closed so that when the auditors come on site, and that's have, Mike Munson. Yeah, Mike Munson. Mike Munson, yeah. the man. Thank you. Um, Who serves as? He's our director of financial reporting. There you go. Um, so he has to have numbers for the auditors to start looking at. So this is a very, very tight timeline because so we get our auditors on site. They come the middle of August. By the 1st of October, they have to have basically our financials reviewed and audited. And what that means is 
It's an outside firm coming in and saying, yes, the financial statements of Mount Land Supply, Mount Contractor Supply Group are stated fairly. There's no material errors. They go through a variety of different tests to basically say that the financial statements are good. So this is a super tight timeline. Generally, this is a process that takes firms months. Um, if we were to go and have a December 31st deadline or year end, we would be clumped together with every single other company and we wouldn't have the ability to leverage and to basically demand this very strict timeline. Do you want to answer that question? Yeah, but what, why is it Ju- July 31st and not August 1st? Or- no. <laughs> Are you, I don't know which part of this question you're going to. Uh, if, I didn't know you are going to be leading me. <laughs> if there's an 8118 thing going on in no, here? No, no, it's 731. There uh-huh. might be two different parties. Two different people that would answer this question differently. <laughs> do, do we need to get documents? So out? if we're to look at the documents for when the ESOP was consummated. <laughs> oh, all right. July 31st, there. 2018. 2018. Yeah. But our first day as an ESOP, 8118. As a marketing person, it just seems much cleaner. It does seem much yeah. cleaner. Okay. But as an accountant, having a month Anagram. end, 731. He's a freak in the sheets. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. So... Having that all close out. So what people, I guess I'll answer my own question here. <laughs> but a lot of people, I get asked this a lot. Why 731, right? Why did, why did, why did you pick this random day? Well, we, we that's when we started or closed on the ESOP and we started the ESOP going. But really what it was is also in there, we were C Corp, right? Yeah. And so you, get, so you start getting into some, we talk about complexity. There's some tax implications there. Um, I'll, I'll share a number. The for every month that we were not an ESOP, because there's tax advantages of being an ESOP that uh, some people know and uh, understand. Maybe we talk about that some other time. But um, for every month that we did not become an ESOP, it was about two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars of tax liability. So taxes we would be paying. That we would, we'd basically be leaving that money on the table. We'd be paying every, Uncle Sam every month yeah. that we were not in yeah. ESOP. So every month that passed that we weren't in ESOP, we'd be paying that amount to Uncle Sam. Which is basically the whole reason you become an ESOP. Well, not the whole reason, but it's a, a huge advantage sure. is that tax savings. That yeah. tax savings it allows you with us with the ROI. Yeah, well, allows us to be able to uh, pay that distribution out right. to the employees. Right. Um, so really. You know, employees out there, you think, you know, the money comes from the company, it does, but it's a lot of it. A lot of it comes from the tax savings that we'd have. Right. So instead of paying Uncle Sam, we're paying you, which yeah. I think is, I'd rather pay my employees than pay uh, Uncle Joe. Much more there. worth it. So, um, but July 31st, so one of the things that we had to do, we were a C Corp, we had to become an S Corp. And so with one of those things, if I remember right, Bruce was on the other side. Bruce wasn't working for us, but he was in public accounting. And they did a lot of research on their side. And uh, you guys came back to us and said that we could do a mid-year change, which was kind of unheard of, right? Yep. Um, but they, there are some legal things that they said, yeah, we feel comfortable with it. You know, we would back you up on that, and the IRS should allow that. And so we did a, a mid-year, year-end change to 731, which was kind of unheard of. I never had – I was in public county as well, never had that happen. So that's why I had that 731 originally but then you know how bruce alludes to it i was saying hey you know this is there's a lot of advantages of ha- us having 731 and we have to be like this for five years which we're up right now yeah we are so technically we could change it to a december 31st year end um i at, as of right now i don't think i would yeah i don't think it. i would either just because if as we go back to kind of that timeline so the auditors are on site August, middle of August. By the end of by the first part of October, they have to have a trial balance together. That's basically verified numbers that we then send on to the valuation firm. The valuation firm has about a month to determine what our valuation is, what our stock price is. And I think if we were to go to a December 31st year end, we wouldn't be able to pack that so tightly. I know there's always questions of how come it takes so long to get the share price. There's lots of process, or there's lots of different steps that it has to go through to get to the end. But if we were to December 31st year end, it would be months longer than what we're currently going through. So, what of those steps? What step are you in right now? 
So the step that I'm in right now is, well, let me back up some of the information that we give to the valuation firm. So we talk about our financial statements. They do a number of other things. So one of the things is they come out on site and they have conversations with management just to figure out, okay, what are you guys seeing in the marketplace? What are your competitors doing? Have you seen anybody come into your markets? Have you established new markets? Have you established new verticals? What are your concerns? What are things that you're hopeful for? Um, in addition to that, we put together a whole packet full of information. We go through our top 10 customers, our top 10 vendors. Um, if there's any weird transactions that happen throughout the year, we also put together as management, we put together pro forma or projections for what the next five years could look like for us, um, just from a, a profitability standpoint. Um, outside of that, that's that's may not sound like a lot, but it's a very simplified version of what it's happens. It's a very simplified version. Yeah. It takes time. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Uh, and there has to be justification for why you're making certain assessments or certain assertions with your projections. Um, once that's all done, we send that over to Stout, who's the independent valuation firm that does our valuation. Um, they review it, they go through it, and they start to basically perform a calculation of value. So that's done in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first thing that they do is they go and they look at the marketplace and see, are there other companies that are like Mountainland that have sold? And if so, what did they sell for? It's as if you put your house on the market, they're going to look at comps. Exactly. Yep. They're looking for comparables. <clears throat> are there companies of the same size, same industry, same market segments that we could look at? Uh, the next thing that they do is they look at our projections. And within those markets... Within those comps, they come up with multiples. And the general multiple they look at is an EBITDA multiple. So, What is EBITDA for the dum-dums <clears throat> in the room? Like EBITDA <laughs> is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And then you add another number in there? E uh, for there ESOP. Go. EBITDA E. E. EBITDA So to basically simplify that whole EBITDA E, it's basically profitability of the company. They'll look at it, the valuation firm will look at it and say, you know, companies that have EBITDA E of a million dollars, they're selling for $4 million. So they imply a four multiple of your earnings. So they'll look at that and basically give Mountainland a multiple. Um, some of the other ways they look at it is they'll look at your projections and say, this should generate X amount of cash, and they'll discount that back to current values say, here's what your stream of cash is worth in today's dollars. So just for just so everybody's aware, too, that's also a similar process we go through when we go to acquire companies, yeah, is to exactly. find a multiple of their EBITDA. Yeah, that's exactly Because it. we well, always want it to add value to our ESOP. Yeah, that's exactly what we do. We know how we're valued, and we never make... We are very conscious of the acquisitions that we're doing, that we need it to add value to our ESOP. So. Awesome. Yeah, so the step that we're in right now is we've submitted our final information. I'm going, I had a call with them about an hour ago where they had some questions on some of the things we put in the projection. We had some clarif clarifying conversations. So we should be getting a value. Well, we don't get the value. The value is submitted to our trustee. Uh, we are a qualified retirement plan. So we have a trustee that's over our retirement plan, which is the ESOP. Um, they're the ones that need to approve the valuation. So for those of you that don't know, this trustee is basically put in charge of making sure that um, that the management team... They are your representation. The, yes, there's the ESOP as participants, participants in the ESOP. representation yep. to make sure that things are going in the right direction. Hey, who chooses this trustee, by the way? It is board approved. Yeah. Yeah, so our board is the one that elects the trustee. So it's not it's not us as employees going out and finding someone, but right. someone else. It's yeah. So we use Great Bank. Um, they are a very well known and reputable trustee company in the ESOP community. So Stout will do their analysis. They'll present it to Scott Storyhan, who's our trustee. He will approve it or reject it, and then based on that conversation, he'll then share with us the share price. So Bruce. We have to ask, do you know what it is? <laughs> I have a very good idea of what it is. Will you share it with us? No. <laughs> okay. I will not. <laughs> just, had to, just had to ask for everybody out there. You, yeah. never, you never get told no if you don't ask the question. 
The answer is always yes, except in this situation. Only if I ask you first. Yes. Yeah. No, there's reasons why we don't share it without the trustee um, approving it. Um, we just need to make sure that he doesn't have any issues with the way the, the report was done or we're, with any of the analysis. Once that's done, I think we'll be making an announcement probably very close to our company party. Because technically, it, it can still change. It could still change. Yeah. Absolutely. All yeah. the way up until he approves it. Yeah. Yep. He's so. the final stamp of approval. So... Uh, so then we get this, you know, he, he reviews it, gives his stamp of approval. Usually what time is that? Like during the year or what? It's in, in November. Of, November? First part of November. Then from there, where, what happens? So then from there, our, our financial statement audit's still in limbo because there's some disclosures that have to happen with that share okay. price. So then we get the share price, we send it to our auditors, they make some adjustments on our financials, and they wrap everything up and conclude our audit. So all this happens between August to the middle of November. So that's three and a half months. Um, I don't know if I can give compliments enough to Mike Munson, to BJ, to RJ, to Kaylee, to everyone on the finance team. That quick of a turnaround time, we are an extremely large company with branches across the country. And there's so much that goes into closing the books, into making this possible. It's a monumental effort to be done in three and a half months. Is it's pretty significant. I hear a lot, you know, just kind of out there when we go to these conferences and stuff like that. That we're probably the fastest, yeah, out there to yeah. wrap everything up. So now we have it. It's you know the the financial the audit is wrapped up. We have our share value. So and it's a report. Yeah, it's like a what is it like a fifty page report, sixty page report, yeah, if 50, I remember 60 correctly. pages. Um, and it's a bunch of just mumble jumble that's in there, right? A lot of numbers. It's and like that. geek and ease. Let, let's just be honest. There's like one page that we go to that we look at to yep. be able to see it, um, what the share value is. But then after that, in in November, we have a board meeting, right? And what yep. happens there with it? So at the board meeting, we have Scott Storyhan comes to the board meeting. Who is? Who is the trustee yep. of our ESOP. He comes to the board meeting and presents the valuation report to the board. And then the board has to approve it as yeah, well. Yeah, then the board approves it as well. So it goes through and two steps. We finally get to talk to people yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, we were talking about oh, that's right. for the end of year party, it's actually going to be before our board meeting. Yeah, mm. which um, is abnormal. Yeah, usually we try and schedule afterwards, but because of some sc scheduling conflicts for event spaces, I think it was. Yeah, it was venues. Um, we're, we're not going to be able to have it because usually what we like to do is on Thursday or Friday have that board meeting and then the Saturday have our end of year party. And this year we're not where it's going to be the end of year party is going to happen before the board meeting. Yeah. So we actually probably won't share it be, until the board actually, yeah. they got to approve it first before right. we even disclose that. So yeah, that's right. So then after that, all this happens, then there's the whole like, what is the ESOP administration side of this that happens, right? <clears throat> yes. Kim Labram does a phenomenal job with that. So once the share price is done, we have to give it to principal, who is the third-party administrator of our ESOP. Or TPA. Or TPA, for those of you that care. Geek and ease. Um, more geek and ease. <laughs> it's easier to say TPA. It is. Or TPA. TPA. They then run all sorts of analysis to see who's up for retirement, who's up for distributions. They're then going through the process of putting together your statements all that information they're then accumulating to be able to give to us by about the end of January. Beginning of January. Beginning of January. That's kind of what we shoot for. Yeah. Beginning of January, they're trying to get all ESOP statements ready. So when Kim and the HR team do the ESOP roadshows that everyone has that information to look at. Again, like it is such a tight schedule. Um, it's pretty phenomenal to be able yeah. to get it all done. Kim, Kim works her guts out yeah. for a month and a half. And it's over the holidays. I feel so bad for, but it's through the holidays, and you know everybody's taking vacations yeah. and things of that nature. Well, and you combine that with open enrollment, yeah, on the insurance that's side. True. Yeah. It's a very busy time of year for the service side of our company. She's, it's like, I mean, she works hard all through the year, but this is like, it's a lot. Yeah, she's in after after drive or whatever overtime, like yep. just going at it. So, um, props to Kim Labram, McClaws. Sorry. Oh my gosh! Sorry, Kim McClaws. Yeah, Kim McClaws, <laughs> put it out there. Sorry, guys. She just got married what, a I year ago. You. I don't know why she wouldn't. Know. Yeah. We've known her for such a long time that it's just—it's Kim Labrum. Yeah, let's 
To me, it's Kim Layroom. In my phone, it still to. says Kim Layroom. So yeah, it takes some getting used to. Yeah. No, but no, sorry, she Michael. She does a great job. We love you, Michael. Her husband. We love you, Michael. Don't don't kill us. So thank you for the timeline. Thank you, Brandon, for a little bit of the history of the ESOP. So the re- another reason why we call this windshield time is hopefully you can just listen to this on your commute and uh, then go on to the next one. So we're going to try and keep them between 20 and 30 minutes. We went a little bit long today. I don't even know how long we went, but I can feel that we went longer. So we're going to try and keep them around 20 minutes. But it was good information that you guys, I think, should hear as responsible owners of this company. So we appreciate you guys tuning in. So thanks for spending some windshield time with us, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.